Okay, we're going to start out talking about something called BARC. And BARC is simply an acronym, which um, is visual, oral, which is auditory or hearing, reading, writing, and kinesthetic. And we'll talk about those, and you'll begin to formulate in your head which one of those you think that you are. But if you want to do the quick little questionnaire to check yourself, you can do that at BARC-learn.com. Right on the screen. Yeah. That's bark-learn.com. All right, so the first one is called visual. And visual people um, like lists. They like to look at charts, graphs, diagrams, flow charts. Uh, these are people that like to use highlighters. They like underlining. And they simply like lists. So if you're a visual person, you like writing things out. And you may already be the student who takes their notes from class, from the lecture, and you immediately after class or that night, you may go ahead and reorganize those notes and even rewrite them in a more concise form that's easier to study by. So if you're visual, you really like writing things out. And um, can anybody look at this slide and tell me what I did to the slide itself that kind of makes visual people happy? Bold? Bullets. Bullets, okay, good. What else? Everything's labeled. Well labeled. Everything's labeled, good. What else? Picture. What about, did you say visual? Yeah, like a picture. Like you see it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. How about the word itself? The title of the slide? Bold, a different color, a different font. So all those things are things that visual people like. Okay. The next one is oral, and these pe these are people who learn best by listening. Um, they like lectures. They like talking and discussing different concepts and notes with fellow students. They like explaining and describing things, and they like to look at a picture and describe the picture, or like a model in a lab. They like the talking part of it or also the listening part of it. These are people who will often use a tape recorder. Uh, if they have permission from their instructor, they can record the lecture. Uh, you may have to go back at times and fill in your lecture notes by asking questions. You can ask fellow students or your instructor. Um, and these are also folks who like to explain again, talk about what they're learning, talk about their notes, talk about a model, talk about a diagram. The next is uh, read and write. This is kind of can be a little bit similar to the visual people in that read and write people like writing things out. Um, they like making lists. They like definitions, um, handouts and textbooks and notes. So again, these people who, who like will write things repetitively, maybe make two or three versions of your notes. Um, they like organizing the charts, graphs, and diagrams into words and explanations. Um, so the example up here is just a definition. Okay, are y'all begin to formulate which one of these learning styles you think you may be? Okay, and the last one is kinesthetic. These are people who like the hands-on stuff. They like to go to a lab and actually touch a model and put their finger on uh, the different parts and name the part. and. Uh, they like anything that they can touch, like an exhibit in the lab, a sample, um, doing a lab experiment, that kind of thing. Um, so what you need to do if you're kinesthetic is reduce your notes, get them down from um, being really wordy to, be, to being concise, and you can act out different concepts or notes, and you can do that um, with someone at home or with another student in a study group. Okay, let's just take a quick poll. How many of you think you may be visual? Okay, probably majority, good. Okay, how about oral or auditory? Couple. Read, write? Okay. And kinesthetic? A good mix. So you're a mixture. I saw you raise your hand a couple times. And that's pretty common. So you can have um, your learning style could be, you know, a combination of a couple of these. 
we do encourage you to go on this website again, bark-learn.com, and just check yourself. Next, we're going to do you want to stop and do it? Yeah, I'll just try to do a maybe a quick activity with this um, idea if you want to go back one slide. Can. Um, so, we asked you what kind of uh, learning style you thought you were. So it'll be interesting when you actually go on the website and take that survey and see which strengths actually come up. Now if you've done that before, you may want to go back and do that again and just make sure and check in and see that you're still the, the rewrite that you think you are, you know, or the, the oral and kinesthetic that you think you are. So we've got um, a couple of groups here. So we want to get you into a couple of groups. And what I just want you to think about for a few minutes, all of you are in anatomy and physiology, either the one semester or one of the two semester classes that we have here. So you're all familiar with um, negative feedback, right? Everybody's learned about that already this semester. So what I want you to do is in some small groups, so we'll just kind of group you up in small groups right here, talk with each other about which one of those styles you would use to study negative feedback. Okay, so try to explain negative feedback to somebody else, perhaps in the visual way, auditory way, read right way, kinesthetic way. Okay, now you're going to maybe go towards your strength, and a lot of you are visual. Okay, so match visual with at least one other one up there. You can match visual and kinesthetic if you want to, or visual and oral. If you want to visual and rewrite, okay, a lot of you are visual. A lot of people actually end up being kinesthetic, okay. So that was acting something out, you know, um, using uh, props, okay, to try to remember something or explain something. So I put some paper here if you wanted to use that to help explain it or um, use it as a study form. Got some markers, I've got some post it notes. Um, so you're welcome to use any of those as well. So what I want you to do is you'll be able to explain how you would study or explain negative feedback to the other groups in just a couple of minutes. Okay? So use one of these four, and normally I have you explain what negative feedback is. But this would be a way, how would you be studying this? Okay? Do you understand what I'm asking? Okay. So maybe just three of y'all maybe, and Two of y'all, sorry, I don't have a third person. But five might be too many. Okay, why don't the four of y'all kind of group up for a minute and talk about what would you use to, under, to remember negative feedback or explain it to somebody else? So the three of y'all are gonna work together. You've got some props if you want to use those to show each other negative feedback. Yeah. All right. About. I need more than five minutes, but I'm going to try to cut you at about five minutes. All right, you all look ready. Okay, so let's just quickly go around and um, talk about what learning style you chose to um, explain or study the negative feedback loops. Okay, so what this group use and talk about? Um, we had kinesthetic and oral because we got a picture. Kinesthetic and oral. All right, so you used a picture. Go ahead. It basically cries about when your body gets hot, how you switch to pull the bed down. So it makes it like a little bit All right, let's start again. They were finishing up. I'm sorry. Say that again. Our example was if someone switch, um, basically negative feedback reverses the process and makes their body cool off to return it back to home. Okay, and you had oral, so you were saying it out loud to each other, and then kinesthetic by physically writing something down, obviously visual as well, then. I like your little stick figures here on there, and the sun, that's good. Um, I might come back to that with another kinesthetic suggestion on there. Okay, what did you all use? Um, I guess we used oral and visual. Visual, uh-huh. Go ahead, hold it up, show us what you do. <laughs> That's okay. We can see negative feedback. Tell us what's on there real quick. 
the steps to make it through this. So we use uh, core temperature as an example. I know your body starts to shiver. Okay, so when you get cold, your body starts to shiver. Response, so you get warm when you're inside. Okay, to try to reverse the cold feeling. Mm -hmm. All right, you've got your steps there listed with arrows, kind of like a pathway, so that's a good visual way. Um, when I've used, um, what's the word I'm looking for, not pathway, um, flow charts, hello, that's what word I'm looking for. When I've used flow charts on the board or, or in something, the students have really appreciated that because it's almost like, oh, that's what you meant, you know, light bulbs. So if your teacher is not doing that, then you need to do flow charts, especially if you're a visual type of a person, okay? And flow charts can be really helpful then. All right? And what did you all think of? Visual. Um, I did it with blood pressure. And, um, okay, so you had a, a visual as well, right? So you started with stimulus, go ahead. Yeah, you have the stimulus of high blood pressure and then your brain sends nerve impulses to your heart to lower the blood pressure and return back to homeostasis. Back to normal, okay. So you all were talking about visual and oral though, right? Or, and, or the ability to talk about it, to, to understand in a different mm -hmm. way. Well, we have people that speak different languages as well, so if we ask questions of, did you have to translate it back into your native language? Mm -hmm. to, um, and it was no, because they both speak English well, so it's... Right, right. But I like what you were also saying about hearing it different ways though, mm -hmm. too because someone from another culture as well or just another background might have an analogy about negative feedback that would be totally different from someone else's and it might help you get a, note, a light bulb about it right. as well. So talking about it with somebody else and getting new analogies going is another oral way of doing that. So that was really good. Thank you for the blood pressure example. Okay. Uh, so what we did, uh, we used oral, visual, and we did write a little bit. Uh -huh, uh, yeah. Uh, sure do. Yes. So we talked about negative feedback, which I am not a big fan, and they have to understand that. Awesome. Um, if you're cold, the it, it stimulates your brain to bring your body back to its normal uh, body temperature. Then it goes to your muscle, and then your muscle react to the shiver. Then your brain is going to be like, oh, you know, react mm -hmm. to it. So the brain then says, we've shivered enough, right? Yes. We've warmed up enough, and so the brain will shut off that shivering process. Because you don't keep shivering, right? Or you don't keep sweating. You stop eventually, right? Okay, so it'll make it, your body go in the opposite direction, back to homeostasis the way you had said, until you're in that homeostasis around that normal place for you, and then it'll shut back off that process again. Um, this is a really good idea, and um, again, it's a flow chart, okay, the way you all had done, but um, you, sir, were talking about having a hard time with the hormones. The hormones, yes. So, abstract. What, I, what I've suggested before, and I don't know if my students do this or not, but I try, um, is perhaps with some of your opposite hormones, like you have your PTH and your calcitonin, or you have um, insulin and glucagon, most of y'all know about insulin. Um, I've said to put those on opposite sides of the mirror and then every time you walk by them you're going to study and review what those are because they're next to each other on the mirror but they're on opposite sides of each other okay because insulin and glucagon do the opposite things gotcha. pth calcitonin do the opposite things you don't have as many of those in hormones but that's a way to start the other thing is you could um, group your hormones as to where they come from like your anterior pituitary gland they could be on the same color or just have them random and you group them together with your post-it notes and that's how you review as well, okay? Because you've got to get some of this kinesthetic going for yourselves at home. We need to move on, but do you have any other comments or questions about using some of those different learning styles? We also want you to come up with some new ways to study. This ain't English, right? It's not psychology, okay? You've got to get some ways to shorten your study time because you don't have the uh, 12 hours a week you need to study in this class okay so you've got to shorten your study time somehow so if you can get some ideas like that um, so that you're studying a little bit all the time then 
you're using your time a little more wisely. Are we and ready? That's a good segue into what we're going to talk about next, which is the SQ3R method of reading. And we know that in um, A&P, as with other subjects, you have a ton of reading assignments to do. So what you want to do is implement this SQ3R method of reading, and it will not only help you read and be more focused when you read, but I think it will help you retain what you're reading as well. So how many of you have trouble like sitting down and dedicating time to reading, but and you're committed to that time, but you may have trouble focusing because there's so much pulling at your brain and your thoughts and what's going on in your everyday life, right? Trouble focusing a little bit? I know I do. Okay, so the SQ3R hopefully will help you to, uh, with the focus. And again, the SQ3R means survey, question, and then three R's are read, recite, and review. So we're going to go through each one of these quickly. Survey is when you get sort of a lay of the land. So if you have a chapter to read, what you want to do is kind of go through that chapter quickly, page by page, look at the headings and the subheadings, maybe any bold words, that kind of thing. Just get an idea of what that chapter is going to encompass. This kind of sets the tone for the time period that you set aside to read. You can also, during that time, look at any charts or graphs Again, just kind of get a feel for what is contained in the chapter. So the next part of the SQ3R method is question. So once you've kind of surveyed what's in that chapter or that section that you're going to read, start asking yourself questions about the chapter. Formulate questions in your head. You may even want to jot those down. Um, you know, those subheadings and headings that you read, Maybe you've heard them before in lecture. Maybe it's just another repetition, which is good. But start writing down questions of what you want to learn or what you want to accomplish uh, finding out when you're reading that section. So read the first and last sentences of a paragraph first. Now, why is that? So you pick a section. You start with the first paragraph. Why do you want to read the first and last sentences? I'm sorry, we remember those letters. You can remember what's going to be in there. The first sentence is usually called what? Like a topic sentence, okay? And then the last sentence usually is like a summary. Very good. And if you're going to highlight, make sure that you highlight selectively. So, you know, if you're reading, you don't want to highlight and color the entire paragraph. You really want to be selective about what you highlight so that when you come back, you have a concise um, chunk of material that you've highlighted. Do you want to add Can that? I add something yes. to that? Um, highlighting selectively is a good idea, especially you've already got the words in bold in that section that you're reading. Maybe just find a key word to underline or to highlight. Underlining in pen or pencil is a good idea as well. The reason I want you to try to do that underlining or highlighting a keyword is when you're taking a test. I want you to pr have practiced that so when you're on the test, you're going to zone in on what the keyword of that question is. Okay, because some of the questions or answers are a little bit longer than others. If you can practice zoning in on that keyword, your brain won't skip over parts of that sentence and you read something totally different that's not there. Okay, so highlighting or underlining keywords while you're reading then that, that practice will carry over to your test taking as well. That's a good point. Thank you. The next step after you've read like a paragraph is to recite it. Talk, you know, talk out loud. Say it out loud to another student, you know, to your pet, to a family member, to the air, whatever you want to do. But just to verbalize what you've read or a summary of what you've read will be another repetition of the material, which is good. And the last R is review. So once you've selectively highlighted or underlined the key words, um, then you'll want to go back and look at those words or sections because those are going to be like your main ideas or main thoughts that you want to glean from that section or that paragraph. Okay, does that make sense? So if, I guess to summarize this method, I would say instead of jumping in and, and sitting there and saying, I'm gonna read this chapter and I'm going to devote two hours to it. 
and you just barge in on the first paragraph, first sentence, here we go. You just want to get it over with, right? If you will follow this method, I think you'll be more focused. And also, we're going to talk about how you need breaks in between reading. You need time to process what you're learning, what you're reading. So the ideal time is about 50 minutes to an hour, and then a 5 or 10 minute break. And it's really good to get up and move and exercise and just move your body during your 5 or 10 minute break. Give your brain a, a rest, okay? So do that and then go back to your reading. That is so much more effective than, like I said, sitting down and plowing through two or three hours of straight reading. Okay? Any questions? Do y'all kind of agree with that? Okay. Let's see. We also say as she's transitioning to um, um, take, the, take the reading in smaller chunks, when we literally call chunking it. Okay? So if you have even an entire chapter or a portion of that chapter, take that into smaller bits and maybe even stop and quiz yourself on that section before you move on to the next section. Did I get the key topic of that paragraph even? And since we've talked about several things on here, I'm just going to go over a couple more things. Um, we just talked about chunking and about taking breaks. After, if you'll see the second bullet point, after two or three of the sessions where you've studied for about one hour and you've taken the five or ten minute break at the end of each hour, then take a longer 30 minute break. You know, walk the dog, do some exercise, phone a friend, you know, just give your brain a rest like I said. Um, just recommended that you study 10 to 12 hours a week and the environment is important too because a lot of people think that they can multitask and have the TV on the background or, you know, be texting someone at the time you're kind of trying to figure out how to read this paragraph and focus. But research actually shows that most individuals do not multitask well. So if you dedicate that time and follow the SQ3R method, I think you'll find that you'll use your time more efficiently and that you'll be more focused. Because you have the phone numbers up there and people who are not here are going to wonder what that meant. Do you mind explaining that quickly because I'm going to use an example of that as well. Okay. We, um, Ms. Rudolph talked about chunking information and that concept came about um, a while back and that's how people way back in the day came up with the number of digits to be in phone numbers because that research shows that that's the number, I think it's seven that the brain retains the most of. So if you're trying to like memorize a list of 12, chunk it out into seven and five. Does that make sense? So you know you're gonna have that long list of bones and that long list of muscles, the parts of the heart, the hormones, okay? So literally try to go over seven, maximum seven or fewer at a time Quiz yourself on those seven, go to the next seven, quiz yourself on the total list, go to the next five or seven, quiz yourself on the total list as you go through, okay? And if you go back and do that little tiny quiz on the previous ones before you move on, it will be that repetition and it will help it stick better. Thanks. Okay. Um, one thing that we wanted to get across in these study sessions is the idea of study groups. That's one reason why I had you do that little activity with the um, learning styles. Because you can see how talking about something, doing something physical with it, you started your list of writing, you started your picture, but you were also talking about it while you did that, you're going to see that it's those pieces that you'll probably remember better and you won't have to study as much especially your negative feedback that you weren't real happy with. Okay, so I think it'll be a lot better for you now. So some people aren't um, enthusiastic about study groups or study partners, but um, a lot of good things about it are, um, you know, you've got the accountability to each other, okay, to try to know that information. And you've got yourself on a, on a timeline as well. If you're meeting once or twice a week, you know that by then I've got to know so and so and it helps to try to keep you on track. Some things about study groups um, are trying to get together on your schedules, but they have, we have the doodle now, Google Doodle, 
So you could get on there and talk with each other if you had three, four, or more in your group, and you could get together and say, okay, we really could meet at Panera or, um, well, you see a ton of people at Panera studying. All the medical students, it seems like, are sitting around there studying together. So there's a, there's a reason for that. It's because it works. Okay, so try to get some time in there if you can. Try to find a study buddy or a group. The max, the optimal number for a study group is supposed to be six, okay, but that's not really feasible sometimes. So see if you can try it out and see if it'll work with you. When we do our second session, we often do a practice study group as well in our second session. Um, so keep that in mind and hopefully you'll use some of those study type things. We also will have um, um, your instructors, okay, or other instructors that are not yours if they're not available are here and available for you to talk things out of as well. In your study group, you need to identify like the moderator or facilitator. That's the person who's going to keep the train on the track. So if you get together and everybody's talking all this social stuff and what they did and what they, they're going to do in the Super Bowl with the Panthers and all that, which is all well and good, that person, that moderator or facilitator, they, they need to get the group back on track and say, look, we just had an hour. Um, we need to focus and you know, so we need to get started. So a good idea to eliminate some of that also is to send each other questions ahead of time uh, by way of email or like an agenda so that you'll have something to follow in your study group. Okay. Any questions or you want to add something to that that has helped you with study groups before at all? They are highly recommended for this class. Right? This class, <laughs> especially this class. Mm -hmm. um, I think you all should have um, this handout called Get Organized. It's a fun, quick little thing that you can do and then um, add your score up and it'll tell you if you're using your time wisely, if you need a little tune-up, or if you just need a major adjustment in how you use your time. So let's just take a few minutes and do this and then we'll talk about it. Okay, let's go over this a little bit, and if you feel comfortable raising your hand or sharing with the class, that's great. If you don't, that's okay, too, but um, how many of you want to share that you're between 65 and 80, and you're doing a great job at managing your time? Peter? Good. So, do you feel like, um, since you're using your time wisely, that you have set aside times to study, and you're using some of the study skills we talked about? Uh, yep. Great. Okay. Um, how many of you need a little tune-up? Okay. Yeah. Just real quick, with one of you share what you think that you could do differently after today that will make you use your time more efficiently. For me, putting it on this, putting it on paper, okay. will make a big difference. That's great. With my time management, I can be accountable for this is what I'm doing and I'm not doing. Great. Okay. I think sticking with this, trying not to deviate it. But at the same time, using the different uh, techniques instead of what I used to do when I was younger, it's not working as much anymore. Fantastic. Okay, thanks for sharing. And if you're 16 to 49, then hopefully you can adjust what you're doing, do something differently, implement some of the things you've learned today. Okay, the segue into that, both of you mentioned using the weekly schedule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, what we'd like for you to do is actually use this, and I think some of you have already identified the importance or the significance of it, but if you'll take this and formulate um, your action plan, as we call it, um, according to the SMART goals, and briefly I'm going to tell you what the SMART goal goals are, S-M-A-R-T, it's an acronym, and it stands for Specific, Measurable, achievable, results focused, and time bound. And just real quickly, what you want to do when you formulate your action plan on this um, weekly schedule, uh, put down specifically what you want to accomplish, whether it is um, reading an entire chapter or a specific number of pages, or to um, become more familiar with um, identifying parts on a model in the lab, whatever you want to accomplish that week, make sure that it's specific. Also make sure that your goals are measurable. 
Um, again, that goes back to, I think, specific measurable tie go hand in hand. You know, designate how much you want to get done, how much you want to accomplish. Make sure they're realistic and achievable. So if you set aside two hours on Monday night, um, you probably can't expect to read four chapters and comprehend that material in two hours. So you want to make sure that your goal is achievable. Um, be results focused. Um, have measurable outcomes that we've talked about. And last but not least, have a time bound. So you're setting aside specific, specific, whoo, specific chunks of time. Um, to study, to review, to rewrite notes, to do the kinesthetic pieces, to be with a study group, all that good kind of stuff. And um, to add to that, on these, be specific, measurable, and realistic, okay, time bound. Don't just put in here study for an hour, okay? What we're suggesting is, okay, for the first 20 minutes, I'm going to do SQ3R, I'm going to scan and make up my questions, okay? If I have time to read a small chunk, I'm going to do that. And then the next 20 or 30 minutes, maybe I'm going to make a few flashcards on the terms that I know I'm going to get stuck on. Not all of them, maybe, but some of those. So be very specific when you're putting your study tools down here as well. Okay? If you're going to, you know, sort hormones for a while, okay, or you're going to make a game out of your flashcards. One of the students made a second set of just the words and had like a concentration game or a matching kind of game that she did as well. Okay, so add in when you go to that barklearn.com, they're going to have several ideas. Your handouts have those ideas on them as well. But be specific when you're writing down. Don't just say I'm going to study or I'm going to read for an hour. Okay, as specific as you can be is going to get you that um, accountability as well that you need and that time management stuff. Is this just for anatomy or is this for all the classes that we're taking? Oh, you can, this is Great. across the board, yeah. yeah. We were just trying to use examples from anatomy when we talked about things in here, but this will cover any of your classes really. And the other thing I wanted to add to um, what Ms. Rudolph just said is that I think it will help you um, not only stay focused, but I think it'll keep you from getting too bored. Like if you just say I'm going to read, like who wants to do that for more than an hour, right? But if you're going to say specific things, like the examples she gave, then you know you're going to maybe read for a while, but then you're going to get up and like put post-it notes on a mirror or something. You're going to get up and move. So if you change it up, mix it up, do all different kinds of things, I don't think you get bored as easily. Um, and then. I like to put up other fun stuff. Research has shown that Baroque music is a good background music to have on when you study. Um, and if you've never heard Baroque music, it is really different. I think it was mainly popular in the 1800s. <laughs> um, but just go to this website or, or Google Baroque music and just check it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not advocating that, but again, it's uh, just something fun to check out. Also, some people um, say that different aromatherapies help them focus, and specifically rosemary, sage, and peppermint. Um, and a lot of people might have their own little study uh, things that they do. And you probably can't read this, but I'll tell you a couple of them. Some people will chew the same type of gum when they're studying, and then chew that gum when they take a test. Um, let's see. Coffee, I heard. <laughs> well, use gummy bears as, as a reward system. I would be Hershey chocolate kisses, but whatever works <laughs> for you. Um, you know, they just do whatever to help you focus and stay on your study goal. So if you come, um, whether you come to the next <coughs> session or not, your, your homework is to lay out your action plan. Okay, so put in your class times, put in your work times, put in times you know you need that are permanent, and then go ahead and fill in times that you have. Be realistic and be very specific about how you're going to study. The other thing was to go to barklearn.com and try to get some new study tools to help you through this class, but also shorten your study time. Make it effective that you're using your study time wisely. Any other questions or comments? We have an um, evaluation page, if you don't mind jotting some things down and letting us have that back. We really need those back from you as well.
Should we need all four sheets? No, all of these are yours except the evaluation sheet. 